Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSE. This video is a tutorial on biology, paper 4 theory, variant 4-2 for October-November 2023 examinations. Question 1 part A. Red blood cells are specialized cells that transport oxygen. State the substance in red blood cell that combines with oxygen. You will learn about the components of blood and its function in chapter 9. The blood consists of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and plasma. Red blood cells, they carry the oxygen in the form of oxyhemoglobin. So the substance in the red blood cell is hemoglobin. Part B. State the name of the component of blood that promotes blood clotting. Make sure you know all the components of the blood and its function. Platelets are involved in helping the blood to clot. So the answer here is platelets. Next, question C. Some students investigated the effect of immersing red blood cells in different concentration of salt solution. They measured the diameters of sample of red blood cells and calculated the mean. They then immersed each red blood cell sample in a different concentration of salt solution. After 2 minutes, they measured and calculated the mean of the samples again. Table 1.1 shows the results. So the first column here is about the percentage concentration of the salt solution. So the percentage of salt solution is increasing, meaning that the concentration of water is decreasing. The mean of the initial diameter of the red blood cell is the same, which is 7.5. This column shows the mean diameter of the red blood cells. Question part 1. Calculate the percentage increase in the mean diameter of the red blood cells that were immersed in the 0.8 salt solution. Give your answer to two significant figures. For 0.8% of salt concentration, the mean diameter has increased by 0.7 micrometers. So let's find its percentage of increase. So it increased to 8.2 and will minus with the actual mean diameter over the actual value times 100%. And we'll get a value on our calculator of 9.333. So converting this into two significant figures, the final answer would be 9.3%. Question part 2. Explain the results for the red blood cells that were immersed in the 1.8 salt solution. The command word being used in this question is explain. It means that it requires you to mention why the results were such in this solution. When you're given with an explain question, try using the keyword because to explain your results. Firstly, let's understand the result for the 1.8 salt solution. Initially, the diameter was 7.5 and it reduced to become 6.0. This means that the red blood cell has shrinked. So let's understand why did this happen. This question is from the part of osmosis. The red blood cell has shriveled because the net movement of water was out of the cell. This must be because the red blood cell have higher water potential than the solution causing the water to move out from the cell into the solution. So the red blood cell shrinked because the 1.8% salt solution has a lower water potential than the red blood cell, giving you your first mark. Therefore, this causes the water to leave the red blood cell by osmosis. And to obtain the last mark, you can use the definition of osmosis to answer your question. Water leaves by osmosis via the semi-permeable membrane down a water potential gradient. Whenever given question about osmosis or active transport, you can always use its definition to explain your question and write as much as possible because you will not know where the marks are coming from. Question part 3. State why there was no change in the mean diameter of the red blood cells immersed in the 0.9 salt solution. For the 0.9 salt solution, the mean diameter remained the same before and after the experiment. When the size of the cell does not change, this is because the water potential is equal between the red blood cell and the solution, meaning that there is no net movement of water. The command word here is state why. If you are asked for why, you can always start with This is because the water potential was equal between the red blood cell and the salt solution. Or you can say because there was no net movement of water. Next, question D. State why red blood cells burst when immersed in pure water but plant cells do not. The difference between an animal cell and a plant cell is that a plant cell has a cell wall. And the function of a cell wall is to give the cell extra support. Since animal cells do not have cell wall, it does not have the extra support needed to maintain its shape. Question E. State two uses of water in a plant. 
There are many uses of water in a plant here, but you are only given with two marks so you can pick any two of these. Question 2. Figure 2.1 is a photograph of some leaves of a water lily, which is a hydrophyte. The water lily has adaptive features that are found in many different hydrophytes. Hydrophyte are plants that live on water. And you will learn about xerophyte, which are plants that live in very dry conditions like cactus. Question E. Describe what is meant by an adaptive feature. To get the definition of the terms that you learn in biology, you can always refer to the core specification. Make sure you're looking at the right one. I will attach the link to this in the description box below. If you go to chapter 18 under adaptive features, you will see that you have already been given the description for adaptive feature, whereby it is inherited feature that helps an organism to survive and reproduce in its environment. Remember that you can get almost all of your definitions as per the marking schemes from your course specification. So make sure you have them for all of your subjects for IGCSC as it can be really handy. Question B. Figure 2.2 is a photo micrograph of a cross section of a part of water lily leaf. Part 1. State the names of the parts labeled A, B, and C in Figure 2.2. You will learn about the leaf structure under Chapter 6 of Plant Nutrition. The upper part here is the upper epidermis followed by a layer of chloroplasts which are stacked together closely, identified as the palisade mesophyll. Part B here is the spongy mesophyll, which is above the lower epidermis, and the empty spaces here are all air space. This is to help the leaf float on the water. Question part 2. Explain how part C in figure 2.2, which is the air space, adapts the hydrophyte for its environment. As mentioned previously, hydrophyte are plants that live on water. So we are required to explain how the air space in the leaf helps this plant leaves on water. So as we can see on figure 2.2, the leaf contains many large air spaces. Mentioning this can give you your first mark. These large air spaces will help the leaf to float on the water surface. Since this plant lives on water, this adaptation is very important for its environment. So you can obtain another mark mentioning this. And lastly, when the leaves are on the surface of the water, this can maximize the light absorption from the sun for photosynthesis to take place. Always pay attention to the number of marks given in your question to know exactly the minimum points that you should have in your answer space. Next, question C. A scientist calculated the mean number of stomata per millimeter square in the upper and lower epidermis. Tomato plants are a type of terrestrial plant. Table 2.1 shows the results. Part 1. Compare and explain the differences in the mean number of stomata in a tomato plant and in a water lily plant. Pay attention here that your command word here is compare, meaning that we are going to require at least two comparisons between tomato and water lily. And your other command word is to explain, meaning that we need to give reasons why there is a difference of number of stomata in the water lily and tomato plant. When you encounter questions that ask you to explain, you can always use the keyword because. You are given 5 marks here, so we need at least another 3 reasons for the differences present. Alright, so let's compare first. For tomato plant, there is significantly a very high number of stomata in its lower epidermis compared to the upper epidermis. Whereas for water lily, there are zero number of stomata in its lower epidermis and a very high number of stomata in the upper epidermis. So we are going to write these points as our comparison. After stating the difference as the comparison, now we have to explain why. So we'll first explain the function of the stomata on a leaf is to allow carbon dioxide to enter and to allow oxygen and water to leave. The upper part of the leaf usually receives a high amount of sun compared to the lower part of the leaf. So if the stomata is placed in the lower epidermis, this can prevent water loss from the leaf. And now we're going to give a reason why lily plant has only stomata on its upper epidermis. Lily plants live on the surface of water, meaning that there is no need to conserve any water here. And since they are floating on the water, only the upper part of the leaf are exposed to the air. Hence why the stomata is only on the upper part. And this way the oxygen can leave. Question part 2. State the name of the cells that control the opening and closing of a stomata. The cell responsible for this is called the guard cells. Question 3. 
Figure 3.1 is a diagram of the junction between two neurons in a healthy person. And Figure 3.2 is a diagram of the junction between the same two neurons in a person who has Parkinson's disease. This disease affects the nervous system. Question A. Identify the parts labeled X and Y in Figure 3.2. X here are little bags that carry the neurotransmitter and these bags are called vesicles. And Y here is pointing to the gap between the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane, which is known as the synaptic gap. Next, question B. Parkinson's disease affects neurons in the brain that are responsible for movement. Using the information in Figure 3.1 and Figure 3.2, suggest and explain the effect of Parkinson's disease on a person's movement. The question here has asked us to suggest the effect of Parkinson's disease. Note here that the command word is suggest. It tells us that we are not expected to know anything about Parkinson's disease, but that we are expected to apply our knowledge or to use the information in Figure 3.1 and 3.2 to help us answer this question. So let's look at the differences. As you can see, a person who has a Parkinson's disease has lesser number of vesicles compared to a healthy person. And we can also notice that the number of neurotransmitters in the vesicle of a healthy person and a Parkinson's disease is significantly different. The Parkinson's disease patient has lesser neurotransmitter, causing lesser neurotransmitter to be released. So now we have to explain how this can affect a person's movement. If there are lesser neurotransmitters being released into the postsynaptic membrane, then there will be lesser impulse that is being sent. If lesser impulse are being sent, then this will lead to lesser movement. So this is how you answer a suggest and explain question. Question C. Describe two ways nervous control differs from hormonal control. The speed of transmission for a nervous system is very fast compared to a hormonal system. When asked to state differences, you can use the keyword then to compare whatever that they're asking you in the question. And the second difference is you can speak of the length of effect, where it is short for the nervous control and longer for hormonal control. For an extra point, you could mention the type of message in a nervous control is electrical impulse, whereas in a hormonal, it's a chemical. Next, question D, part 1. The shape of the receptor proteins shown in figure 3.1 and figure 3.2 is important for their function. Explain how the shape of the receptor proteins is determined. To answer this, you must have a strong understanding of your chapter 17, protein synthesis. In this chapter, you will learn how the shape of receptor proteins are determined. They are determined by the sequence of bases in the DNA or mRNA. Each basis of the codes are for a specific amino acid. So the sequence of amino acid will determine the shape of receptor protein. Next, part 2. Cell membranes also contain protein carriers. Describe the role of protein carriers. This question is from the chapter Active Transport. The protein carriers will help move or carry the molecules or ion across the membrane and this process here needs energy, so it is done by active transport. If you'd like to add, you can also mention that active transport happens against the concentration gradient. Thank you for watching. I'll be explaining question 4 to question 6 in the next video.